And we are now live. Hello and welcome. It's now seven o'clock and we're gonna go ahead and start this uh, public debate. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Those of you who are joining us here on Zoom and those of you who are joining us uh, out from YouTube. Uh, my name is Helen Morgan Permet, and I'm the Edwin W. Lawrence Professor of Forensics and Director of U UBM's Lawrence Debate Union. And I will be the moderator for tonight's uh, public debate on uh, the future of UVM. I want to thank our co-sponsors for this event who have been involved uh, in helping us to uh, put on this public debate. Uh, so this uh, it's co-sponsored by UVM United Academics, UVM United Against the Cuts, the Vermont AFL-CIO, and the Will, Mil Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Series. So thank you so much to, for all of the help that um, our co-sponsors have helped uh, to provide to make this de debate happen. Um, so why a public debate? So public debates are a service of the Lawrence Debate Union to uh, provide education to the community about issues of pressing public controversy. Uh, so the goal of a public debate uh, is to bring the issues of controversy to the fore and be able to put this, the con controversial ideas into conversation with each other so that the public can uh, have better tools for decision making around those particular controversies. The Lawrence Debate Union has a long history, um, not only of competitive debate at the collegial level, but also in this community service of providing public debates, um, especially on key issues affecting our local communities and UVM in particular. And our mission really is to use debate as a tool for advocacy, social change, and democratic deliberation, of which all of these key, key things are a component of tonight's debate. Um, so the topic for tonight's debate uh, is drawn from the controversy over the recent decisions of President Suresh Garamella's restructuring of the University of Vermont. Um, and that restructuring includes things like university reorganization, as well as cuts to each of the colleges in the university, um, but especially deep cuts to the College of Arts and Sciences. For the administration and the Board of Trustees, these cuts are seen as an essential component of securing UVM's future in a competitive university market. Uh, but critics, uh, including faculty, students, alums, and community members, view these cuts instead in the reorganization as well, not as something that will save UVM, but rather something that puts it in greater peril, leading uh, ultimately to a petition of no confidence in the Garamilla administration that's garnered over 3,500 signatures. Um, so this is a huge controversy within the community, um, and we really want to bring these arguments more to the fore and really understand how they interact. Um, thus, tonight's topic is, is the Garamilla administration leading UVM on a destructive path? Um, unfortunately, the administration has declined to debate. They were invited to come and to represent their position, but they were unable to participate in the debate. Um, thus, we have drawn students from the Lawrence Debate Union to take up the position of the affirmative uh, in place of the administration in good faith. The students have drawn on the administration's public comments to construct their arguments and their reputation. So they're really, they're sort of playing the role of the administration. So I wanna just stress here that this is not the, the, the position that the students from the LDU are taking tonight are not necessarily their own opinions, um, but rather they're presenting the opinions, the perspectives and the facts um, of what the administration's position on these issues are. So they're not necessarily the, the, the positions of the students. Um, and this is often something that we do in debate. Uh, we call it switch sides debate, where we take an opposing position that um, may or may not actually be what we believe. Um, oftentimes in order to kind of understand whether or not we really should believe what it is that we believe, um, but also to make a good faith effort to put competing, uh, competing ideas into conversation with one another. Uh, the negative side tonight will be represented by members of the group UBM United Against the Cuts, uh, which is a collective of students, faculty, staff, and community members that are concerned about the administration's cuts to faculty and education at UVM. So on the affirmative side, taking the position that yes, the administration is leading UBM, UBM on a destructive path. Uh, we have three participants. And maybe if you want to unmute uh, your video when I introduce you so that our audience can know who you are. 
Um, first, speaking first tonight will be Beth Mintz, uh, who is a retired professor of sociology. She's working on a book on the current crisis in higher education. Speaking second tonight is Clara Maritorano, who is a mathematics major and physics double major, actually, and theater minor, going into her fourth year at UVM. Uh, they are a member of the Lawrence Debate Union and an organizer with UVM Union of Students. Even with all of this, Clara still finds time to go hiking with friends, tutor chemistry, and play volleyball. Finally, for the affirmative side, speaking third tonight will be Daniel Montneau, who's an incoming PhD student where he will study the molecular mechanisms of acclimation to temperature. Before coming to UVM, he studied biology and neuroscience at the University of Connecticut. Dan is a member of UVM United Against the Cuts and UVM Union of Students. He's organizing with UVM Graduate Students U United for a livable wage and collective bargaining rights for graduate employees at the University of Vermont. So on the negative side of the debate tonight, uh, we have uh, two Lawrence Debate Union students. Uh, speaking first and third will be Isabel Burney, who's a dual degree student at UVM studying music education and history. Isabel is a rising senior at UVM and on the LDU. And when not debating, uh, she enjoys ice hockey, snowboarding, and really big books. And uh, speaking second for the negative will be Owen Webster. Owen is also a rising senior at UVM who is studying English and music. Uh, also a member of the LDU, but when not debating, he enjoys playing music with friends, going for walks, and watching British comedies. So those are the uh, team members tonight. Uh, the format of our debate uh, will be three speeches on either side of the debate. So the affirmative will have three speeches, and the negative will have three speeches, and they will alternate positions. The first speeches for both sides will be six minutes, and they'll introduce the opposing side's positions. The second speeches on both sides will also be second minutes, six minutes, and they will refute the opposing arguments as well as extend their team's position. In the third speeches, which are five minutes, each side will summarize their position in the debate, taking into account the opposing team's overarching reputation and explain why their side should win the debate. So as you're listening to the debate, you wanna be thinking about what are the sort of key clash areas that, uh, that are sort of coming to the fore between these two positions um, and taking notes on what you think that each side is perhaps not sufficiently addressing. So because following the debate, we will have a 20 to 30 minute uh, time for questions and answers from the audience. And so I will ask you to please type your question into the chat. Um, and I will remind you at this point, but um, do, for the Q&A, the students are not necessarily going to answer for the administration because we don't, we don't necessarily know what would the administration say um, to your question. So they'll be answering from um, their position. So just keep that in mind as you think about what kinds of questions you wanna answer, what, that, that you would like to ask. Following the Q&A period, uh, Jacques Bailey, who's a professor of classics, will deliver a final takeaway from the debate. So with that said, I am going to ask the debaters to please keep their own time, but should you go over your allotted time by more than 15 seconds or so, I will then ask you to please you know, wrap up your point um, and stop speaking so that we leave time for um, everybody to have a, have a chance to get their say in. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute myself and open up the debate by welcoming our first affirmative speaker, Beth Mintz. Thank you, Helen. We're here tonight because the university administration is failing us. We believe that the administration should, should address the concerns and questions that have been raised over the last year or so. This was an opportunity for them to do so. They declined, so we're gonna proceed without them. We question the wisdom of many, many of the cuts that have been made, but tonight I'm going to concentrate on cuts to the College of Arts and Sciences. We believe that these cuts are wrong, they're unnecessary, and they're destructive. To demonstrate this, I'm going to develop three different points. The first point, underfunding the College of Arts and Sciences is bad for students and it's bad for the institutions. But I think it's important to remind us and to stress that the college has been underfunded for a number of years now. This is not a new event, but rather 
my own department, sociology, we used to be 18 faculty members. We're now down to nine. The very vulnerable classics department has shrunk from nine to four. And this is happening throughout the college. Moreover, these cuts have been non-strategic. Non We're losing our best teachers as senior lecturers are dismissed. Some of our best departments are being devastated as retirees are not being replaced. Students suffer from this. Their choices are becoming more and more limited just at the time when the value of liberal arts education remains outstanding. Despite claims to the contrary, liberal arts is unmatched for teaching critical thinking, problem solving, and creativity. Students know this. They continue to enroll in our college and they continue to come to us. Employers know this. A recent study by the American Association of American Colleges and Universities of 500 business executives found that they want applicants with strong liberal arts backgrounds. Number two, the so-called budget deficit driving cuts to the college does not exist. So you, the College of Arts and Sciences is, is short neither students nor revenue. Actually, it's short faculty and indeed the college is scrambling to, to staff classes for the, uh, the incoming uh, cohort. But more generally, just about every student at the University of Vermont takes courses in the College of Arts and Sciences and almost half major in one of its departments. The college is accused of having an $8.6 million deficit, but this is a budgetary fiction. Between 2016 and 2020, $34 million in tuition revenue generated by the college was transferred to other units. By all objective accounts, the University of Vermont is in good fiscal shape. Indeed, it's what Moody's calls, and I quote, very, they have what Moody's calls, and I quote, very high levels of spendable cash, unquote. These very high levels equal about $100 million with an additional $100 million from emergency federal relief efforts. And that is a lot of money. Number three, Underfunding the College of Arts and Sciences is not going to solve our problems. Indeed, it's going to make them worse. The way UVM works, and it's worked forever, is that it's tuition driven. That means that it depends on tuition dollars and student tuition to pay the bills. And in our case, it means recruiting from out of state. Historically, we've depended on a very, very strong College of Arts and Sciences to attract these students. Now, Moody suggests that UVM's academic profile as a comprehensive research university will continue to attract its students despite its highly competitive environment. The problem though, is that we're moving away from this comprehensive university model to a job training shop, and it does not seem to be going very well. In 2019, when President, President Garamelli arrived, we were number 40, 96 in the US News and World Report rankings. And that's a measure widely followed by parents. Now we're 118, which means a 22 point drop in just two years. And that is a very big deal. This suggests that relying on the promise of job training in technical fields to draw students carries great risk. It assumes that students will come here rather than to one of our many better established competitors. It also assumes that fields and style right now will continue to thrive. But as Harvard economist Leonard Katz notes, and again, I quote, when we attempt to forecast jobs 10 to 20 year, to 15 years out, we don't, don't even get the categories right, unquote. Well, what do we want if we don't want what's happening now? And the answer is number one, we want the administration to drop the fiction about the Co College of Arts and Science budget deficit and tell us what resources are available and where does the college's money go. We don't want to have to rely on Moody's to get a read on our financial health. Number two, we want to stop the hollowing out 
of the academic units on campus and the hollowing out of arts and science in particular. We'd like that college to be scored, restored to its former strength and that would only be good for the university. Number three, we want the UVM trustees to hear us when we say that we have no confidence in the current administration and the path that they put us on is chaotic, abusive, and destructive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that speech, Dr. Mintz. We'll now turn it over to the negative side and our first speaker for the negative, Isabel Burney. Thank you. In responding to the affirmative points that um, underfunding CAS is bad for students, that this budget deficit doesn't exist, and that the administration is simply making UVM's problems worse, we've compiled responses from the words of the administration themselves. Starting with the Amplifying Our Impact Strategic Vision for UVM, the administration believes that UVM is poised and ready to build upon their reputation as a premier research institution focused on sustainable solutions with local, national, and global applications. Their distinctive strengths align with the most pressing needs of our time, the health of our societies, and the health of our environment. They believe that to more fully realize their potential, they must view all endeavors through the lens of enhancing student success on campus and beyond, while drawing upon unique strengths as one of the nation's first land grant universities. Uh, the administration states in this amplifying our impact vision that UVM needs to provide an unparalleled educational experience for students by continually enhancing course offerings through rigorous, eva rigorous evaluations and evolution and alignment with a liberal arts foundation and societal demands. The University of Vermont's future success will be assured by following these three strategic imperatives, student success and experience, focusing on expanding upon distinctive research strengths and better realizing their land grant mission. Um, in response uh, to hearing about the cuts to the College of Arts and Sciences, Patty Prelock stated in a November 2020 email that since 1911, UVM has undertaken nearly three dozen college level reorganizations and ongoing development and change in individual academic programs. However, for the last 20 years, the university's overall academic structure has remained relatively static, despite several substantial efforts to imagine a reorganization that would streamline administrative processes and enhance academics. Prelock states that in 2009 and 2012, groups tasked with examining UVM structure proposed a range of model changes. Prelock's rationale for the cuts to the arts and sciences include that the college's enrollment has been shrinking over the last decade with 983 fewer students today than in 2010. Prelock states that the enrollment in each one of the majors proposed for termination amounts to less than one half of 1% of the college's total student enrollment of approximately 4,650 students, and that, the, and that over a three year period, the average for degrees awarded annually in each of the majors proposed for termination is five or fewer per year. This need to aggress the declining and low enrollment has been a topic of conversation in the college for the past five years, including the work of a 2018 task force. Prelock states that CAS must ensure its departments, majors, and minors with high enrollment demand have the resources to provide high quality instruction and course offerings, and that they agree that instruction in the classics, geology, and religion department is excellent and expect many of the most popular offerings in these programs to continue to be offered by the college. Prelock states that yes, change can be unsettling, but this move will strengthen the liberal arts at UVM and ensure rich and diverse offerings in languages, arts, humanities, and social sciences. Prelock continues that many of the faculty members in these departments will transition to other departments in the college where they will continue to offer courses in their disciplines and that these course offerings will continue to provide excellent options for students to fulfill uh, their liberal arts requirements. They do not believe that their current cuts are underfunded CAS. In response to this idea about the budget deficit, the administration has continually stated that there is a budget deficit, that the pandemic has only made the situation worse, and many of the funding is restricted for them to use. In a Burlington Free Press article in December of 2020, it states that the University of Vermont is working to address a budget deficit of 8.6 million. 
President Giramella stated in a February 2021 op-ed that the pandemic and its financial impacts on UVM amount to about 40 million or more in unplanned expenses and as much as $25 million in lost revenue. According to the VP of Finance at UVM, from a Burlington Free Press article, they've taken about $50 million out of the budget over the past 10 years or so to balance everything out, and this cannot continue. UVM spokesperson Enrique Cordero, I apologize for the mispronunciation, said in a Valley News article in 2021 that they have been receiving widespread support from people who are pleased that the university is examining these issues and taking care to ensure that the student tuition dollars, which pay for 75% of their general fund expenses, are used responsibly. Furthermore, the retirement or reconfiguration of programs is needed to ensure that UVM remains a robust and relevant university that truly meets the needs of 21st century students and of their surrounding communities. He states that UVM needs to address the $8.6 million structural deficit, and that while UVM did report a $24 million gain in their endowment, it would be a breach of fiduciary responsibility, he said, for the university to use endowment resources for any purpose other than the prescribed by the donors, and that there's $34 million in discretionary reserve, but that's a one-time emergency cash reserve that cannot be used. Essentially, they say many of these funding is in fact restricted. Focusing on this last issue, that this is only going to make problems for the worse for the future, and we cannot predict what people want. Garamella again stated in a February 21 op-ed that retiring majors and minors with low enrollment across the university will allow them to invest in those with high student demand. That this is in fact taking the first step in a forward-looking academic reorganization that will simplify and streamline how schools and their schools and colleges in a way that decreases costs and promotes interdisciplinary research. Uh, the last justification the administration gives is that, again, according to Garamella, that UVM is not alone in taking these kinds of steps. Ithaca College and the Pennsylvania State Higher Education System, among many others, are also rethinking how their institutions are structured. This is how the administration responds. Thank you. Thank you so much for that speech, Isabel. We'll now turn it over to the affirmative position to the affirmative team and Clara Martirano will give the second speech for the affirmative. First, I would like to thank my peers for taking time from their days to represent the administration when they refuse to be here again and to reiterate that they do not necessarily believe the administration's points. Indeed, our own speech and debate minor is on the chopping block. I also do not represent the entire Lawrence Debate Union. Their absence, um, the administration's absence here tonight is even more trouble troubling given the fact that our opponents are only left with the public statements made by the administration. And it is, it is clear that they have not addressed any of our main arguments. I would like to go back to Beth's arguments and demonstrate why the negative team is lacking in any engagement and say why they need to say yes to a vote of no confidence in this administration. Let's review Beth's arguments and I'll respond to the negative side throughout. First is the question of gutting the humanities. UVM is an institute of higher education, and that means it has duties to students, faculty, staff, and Vermont, and quite honestly, um, to society as a whole. Additionally, UVM is a land-grant institution. The land-grant universities were built to enhance the study of environmental sciences, technology, etc. It is explicit in its statement that it should not be at the expense of the liberal arts. A bit of irony to note here is that geology is critical for research in climate science. UVM's renowned geology department, which has accepted grants from the institutions such as the National Science Foundation, is being slotted for termination. In fact, while the actual vision statements of the university reads to be among the nation's premier research universities with comprehensive commitments to the liberal arts, education, environment, health, and public service, Garamella's vision promises only exposure to the humanities. The key here is exposure versus leading in all of these areas. The reality is that the move here is significant and is destroying the liberal arts at UVM to the detriment of all students. The administration is saying, Oops, just lost my place. <laughs> the administration says here that they are finding other places for faculty and programs that are cut and that they will all still offer students viable, 
vibrant liberal arts courses, but this is simply not true. Cutting entire departments and just keeping their intro classes is very underhanded. It ruins research opportunities, projects, and other opportunities for faculty and students to be intellectually engaged with academia and the world around them. And it, it also ignores that we cannot predict our future. The incoming class is much larger than they have been expected. This also discourages professors with expertise from coming to the university and that the best professors that we have will and already have started leaving. UVM is a public university and one of the only universities in Vermont available to in-state students. I myself could not afford to go anywhere else. By gutting the liberal arts, UVM cuts out an entire group of students from the ability to study what they want or maybe even go to college at all. Elite and expensive schools are not available to many students for many reasons. This is especially true for departments with small numbers of graduates, such as classics, because they are often then seen as things to study in old prestigious libraries and therefore become hard to study outside of such places when state schools shut them out. Even so, by saying only a small number of students are affected, this ignores all of the larger issues that were stated by myself and Beth and the blatant incorrect facts about the budget. UVM is failing its duties and ignoring us all in the process. We have to acknowledge that this ignores um, that weighing the value of education on the current number of students in a program is a horrifying way to do so, and that this could, that, but that could be an entire other speech. Now let's talk about the question of finances. And while the administration tries to defend the idea of a deficit, they continually ignore all of our arguments on this topic. Beth has given you the numbers. This is the same data that the United Against the Cuts group, many faculty, staff, and students have been getting at all year. It all leads to one thing, and that is a manufactured budget deficit and a misuse of funding. The administration continues to try to exploit the pandemic to justify their cuts, but we know that this is just a ruse and that they do not lose as much money as they say. Given the amount of aid they have received by the federal government that, by the way, they still have not accounted for. In fact, Beth tells you that between 2016 and 2020, $34 million in tuition revenue were generated by CAS and were transferred out to other units. Garamella is always saying that UVM is thriving. The number for CAS, but the numbers for CAS are up in this fall. And the reality is that this is not a budget crisis, but a crisis that our administration has is devaluing the liberal arts. They do not have the best interest for Vermont or Vermonters in mind. UVM is profit driven and I can only wonder what this means um, by programs remaining static when they have seen departments like sociology, classics and physics with professors over the years. Now that we have shown that we were, that they are gutting the liberal arts despite saying otherwise, there is no budget crisis. I want to reinforce that this is going to be very bad for the future of UVM. Not only has Beth explained that employers tend to prefer a liberal arts education, it must be stated that studying the liberal arts is important for having a depth in an education. The liberal arts is defined to include natural and social sciences, humanities, arts, and math. The sciences teach us about the world around us and how to observe and problem solve. The humanities teach us about our history, critical thinking and compassion, and the arts teach us how about ourselves and how we relate to the world and each other. All of this is critical when we work, when there's work to be done in social justice, climate change and the future. These are things that are undeniably valuable when the world needs leaders, thinkers, and artists. The current administration is dangerous for the future of UVM, and on a smaller scale, our school community is hurt, and on a wider scale, UVM cuts itself out from being leaders in society. After all this, making things even worse, the administration has done all of this while ignoring the pleas of students, faculty, staff, and the community, and just about everyone. UVM has said that they have committees to listen to students and faculty input, but educators are never consulted. As a student, I've never seen a clear opportunity to be heard by the university with an expansive history of ignoring us all, condescending and ignoring our demands for COVID safety, public and publicly making a statement on sexual assault on campus only after the university was publicly slandered to incoming students. They are determined to wait us out and wear us out and avoid trouble that they cannot. Not only is this the second debate this year, but we have also had three major protests on campus. UVM, the fight is not over. Thank you, Clara, for that speech. We'll now turn to the opposing team. Uh, and the speaker will be Owen Webster. Okay. Okay, here we go. 
The affirmative side have built their arguments upon three main points. One, that the UVM administration strategy of amplifying our impact is destroying the College of Arts and Sciences and that this is bad for both students and the institution. Two, that the so-called budget deficit that is driving cuts to the college does not exist. Three, this strategy will not solve our problems, but make them worse. We've just heard more from Clara about the personal damages that have gone on because of the university, about how students and faculty are not being heard and about the way that UVM is changing up its liberal arts. First, on students not being heard, the admin don't buy this point. Obviously, being in close contact with over 12,000 students total is too much. However, the admin has students on the UVM Strong Committee where they speak for students, along with student council, to which students elect representatives to help address the university issues. On faculty not being heard, complaining about the budget, I refer to what Patty Prelock said when on local news, quote, I wish the solutions were as simple as the faculty is suggesting in their press release. We wish that there were indeed funds that the university could access to address all of our budget challenges, but all the funds that they cite are there for a specific purpose and cannot necessarily be redirected to fit another purpose. Second, on changes to the College of Arts and Sciences, the admin disagree with the affirmative that this change is cause for alarm. What they fail to recognize is that the administration is playing the long game with the UVM 2050 vision being one that reimagines what a university education looks like, being enabled by, quote, interdisciplinary research institutes and, quote, non-traditional education, among others, according to their plan. On asking all of UVM's schools and colleges to review programs for possible elimination, Patty Prelock writes, quote, Dean Falls reports some significant collaborations and discussions among these chairs and departments, initiating really creative ways to capitalize on their resources and expertise. Several departments are looking at how they might combine where there are natural synergies, end quote. With this interdisciplinarity, it may be the case that some faculty will be let go. As my partner said in quoting Patty Brulock, change can be unsettling, but this move will strengthen the liberal arts at UVM and show rich and diverse offerings in languages, arts and humanities, social sciences and natural sciences continue to be at the core of the education UVM provides for our students. For more on the cuts to low enrollment programs, UVM has been addressing a quote, budget deficit of 8.6 million and trying to meet student demands for other programs. According to the Cynic last February, with an estimated 35 million in revenue losses due to COVID-19 and another expected loss of over 10 million over the next two years, UVM's current budget is unsustainable, VP of Finance Richard Kate said. Quote, we've taken about 50 million out of the budget over the past 10 years or so to balance everything. We can do that for quite a while, but we can't do it forever, Kate said. During the board's first meeting of the year on February 5th, trustees met virtually where they approved President Garamella's tuition freeze for the third consecutive year and discussed further budgetary cuts across the university. The tuition freeze is a big accomplishment, especially with budget issues, Garamella said. Quote, this is the right thing to do. I'm very proud of the board and all our staff that were able to propose something like this. I think it's really quite monumental and I hope we all understand the gravity of what this means to our families. I'd now like to turn my attention to talking about why the number of in-state students is so small. Some numbers for you. Half of, you, of Vermont's high school seniors pursue a college education. Two thirds of that group, about 2000 students, apply to UVM. UVM admits 68% of those applicants, 44% of in-state students at UVM attend tuition free. It is true that Vermonters make up only about 20% of UVM's incoming class, a number that increases to 27% for the total undergraduate population. But the factors that explain that 20% figure are easy to understand. One, Vermont's small population, the second lowest in the nation. Two, the limited number of high school graduates resulting from that small population. Three, the low percentage of Vermonters who go on to college, which is close to last in the nation. And four, the attraction that going beyond our state's borders holds for some of our young people. Now, just imagine if the percentages were flipped and Vermont students made up 80% of the first year class. This would translate to a much smaller undergraduate student population of about 2,740, rather than the 10,700 students we have currently. And on that scale, we would not be able to support a complex and comprehensive university with medical, engineering, education, nursing, agriculture, business, natural resources, and liberal arts academic units, all of which the state has come to count on with well-founded pride. 
We must respond to these pressures by thinking ahead to becoming an institution whose degree programs appeal to and meet the needs of the 21st century student and whose areas of strength attract more research recognition and support. A reorganization that achieves these aims of reducing complexity and administrative costs, strengthening our research profile, increasing external funding resources and enhancing student interest nationally and internationally will help us become an institution that will be growing and thriving 30 years from now. Thank you. Thank you so much for that speech, Owen. We'll now turn it back to the uh, affirmative team and uh, our final speaker for the affirmative, Daniel Montenot, will give that speech. My bad, my bad. <laughs> to the negative team and the final, and Isabel Burney will give that speech. Thank you. So just to start off, with why, in the administration's eyes, this debate is taking place. If you look again at the email that Patty Prelock sent in December, a lot of the controversy started when um, faculty and students in the College of Arts and Sciences expressed you know, distress about the recent announcement to cut cast majors and minors that were recommended for termination. The administration, Patty Prelock, stated that there was inaccurate information circulating, and that's what we've addressed, we've addressed in this debate, and that it's important that they want everyone to know that there is clear and accurate understanding of what these proposed changes are and what they mean for students. Going back to the Amplifying Our Impacts strategic statement, the administration believes that they're providing unparalleled educational experience for students by continually enhancing course offerings through rigorous, rigorous evaluation and evolution. In a alignment with liberal arts foundation and societal demands. We've, we heard from Clara and from Beth, their first speaker, that, we're, that, this, that they're concerned that the administration is cutting too many of these programs. But as we've continually demonstrated through the words of Patty Prelock, the administration believes that courses in many of these subject areas will continue after the major or minor has been eliminated. Some of these terminated majors will retain their minors, still offering a formal way for CAS students to include these areas in their study. And the administration stresses in all of their communication that students will still be able to enroll in the college's 44 remaining majors in the liberal arts and 52 remaining minors in the liberal arts. Quite frankly, the administration um, has not demonstrated the same level of concern and continually stresses these points. That these programs will continue and these professors will simply be moved or teach other courses. On to this issue of budget deficits. The administration continues to stress the issue that these budget deficits are real, are insurmountable, and the many of the funds that um, continually being pointed out by the affirmative are restricted and cannot be used in the way that we that we would wish. As uh, my partner Owen stated in his previous speech, Patty Prelock has been quoted as saying that these solutions are not as simple as the faculty is suggesting, and that they wish there were indeed funds that the university could access to address all of their budget challenges. But all the funds they cite are there for specific purposes and can't necessarily be redirected to fit in other things. There are, as somewhat seem to be acknowledged, issues with the budget, issues about the future and about what the university will look like. As Owen stated again in his speech, the university administration believes that they are looking at the long term, at the 50 year plan, in 30 years, what is happening. And the administration is concerned that the affirmative's arguments focus too much on short term impacts and short term effects. The administration believes that they need to account for long term plans. They do not think they can use the endowment in the ways that the affirmative would have them. And they believe that in order to prepare for long term success, they need to focus on things. Um, like maintaining health for our society, focus on majors that have high enrollment over majors that have low enrollment in order to ensure that there is continued resources for these majors and programs with high student demand in order to meet the needs of our society. Um, on to the point that Clara stated that there was limited student involvement and that the administration is not listening to the faculty, uh, alumni and students involved. As Owen stated in their speech, they have a student on many of their boards. Students are able to elect leadership uh, in the SGA to address these concerns. Um, 
And they believe that there were working groups, as, as I cited, the administration stated in my first speech, that there were working groups in 2018 to address these changes. Uh, Patty Prelock continually emphasizes that change can be unsettling, but it has to happen. And the, it, it is the position of the administration that change needs to happen now in order to prepare UVM for the future. And these are some of the only changes that they believe are going to be able to have the most effect in order to allow humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences to continue to be at the core of education for the UVM. This last point that has really been discussed is, is this going to make UVM a sustainable university for the future? And I've sort of already been addressing that, but considering what the administration believes are the main issues, considering the budget deficits, considering the discrepancies in student participation in many of these majors, the administration believes it needs to follow universities like Ithaca College, like Pennsylvania State University schools and make serious restructuring changes in order to prepare for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella, for that speech. And I apologize for making a mistake on the format. It is common for affirmative teams to speak first and last. Uh, and so we're following uh, the debate format that is most common. Um, and so now I will call upon our final affirmative speaker, Daniel Montano, to close out the debate. Hey guys, I'm speaking last. <laughs> um, and Thanks everyone for coming. So we, we believe that the administration of Suresh Garamella is leading UVM down a destructive path. And we believe that he's doing it in basically three ways. First, by faking a budget crisis to cover up the funneling of money out of the College of Arts and Sciences. Second, by chronically underfunding the, the College of Arts and Sciences to the detriment of the university as a whole. And thirdly, by failing to listen to students and betraying the university's mission to provide them a comprehensive commitment, uh, provide them an education with a comprehensive commitment to the liberal arts. First, as Beth and Clara have underscored, there's no budget crisis in the College of Arts and Sciences, and student interest in the, in the liberal arts is not in decline. Although it is true that the size of the college has decreased over the last 10 years, enrollment has been steadily increasing for the last five. Um, and this past year, there is a uh, record enrollment in the incoming freshman class that exceeded expectation, causing the administration to largely uh, reverse course or at least uh, buffer some of these proposed cuts. Um, so the budget crisis that the administration claims is actually a fabrication or a result of incentive-based budgeting. So this budgeting scheme over five years and uh, has drained over $34 million out of the college um, to support other programs, um, as well as uh, administrative salaries, consultants, and other amenities. Uh, to sum up, the College of Arts and Sciences is short neither students nor money, and the administration themselves fabricated both the budget crisis and this assumed lack of interest in the liberal arts. Um, <clears throat> Second, underfunding the College of Arts and Sciences, a betrayal of UVM's mission for all students. Um, so I feel that this betrayal is best exemplified uh, by the, uh, I guess, variation um, between the actual vision statement of the university, which reads exactly to be among the nation's premier research universities uh, with a comprehensive commitment to liberal arts edu education, environment, health, and public service. Um, and I feel that the administration has failed um, in a lot of these regards, but in Garamella's uh, Amplifying Your Impact vision statement, he promises only an exposure to the humanities, uh, as well as a lot of other things that he says will increase enrollment and increase uh, the national caliber of the university. Although I feel like a lot of, this, uh, a lot of the administration's decisions are, are having quite the opposite effect. Uh, Garamella says that we are going to uh, recruit more graduate students from across the country, um, but how is this possible when graduate students aren't being paid um, a living wage? So the negative side argued that the proposed cuts in the college uh, won't affect many students, but it's true that if the proposed cuts went through entirely, that would have decreased the total offerings in the college by 20%. And although the negative argues that it's okay, uh, and that you know, still not many people are gonna be affected since um, students from other departments will still be able to take courses that might still be offered. I feel like this sort of um, is a watered down version of the full experience. So this is far from a comprehensive commitment to the liberal arts in many ways. 
the students essentially are not going to have access to the same breadth of courses and be able to participate in the depth of research um, and scholarship that comes along with having fully fledged academic programs. Finally, underfunding uh, education at UVM won't solve any of the problems, but it instead creates them. Uh, so in UVM's mission, this comprehensive uh, commitment to the liberal arts kind of uh, you know, serves both in-state and out-of-state students in similar and differing ways. As, uh, you, as Vermont's flagship school, it's important that in-state students have uh, the ability to study uh, any discipline they want affordably. Um, and these proposed cuts would have greatly harmed that. So the humanities and the arts shouldn't be um, something um, that it should be restricted to someone who could afford um, a private college. It should be available to Vermonters and these departments should be doing service as the classics department um, does with Latin Day, and there's plenty of other examples where um, uh, UVM is uh, having impact uh, beyond the school itself and, you know, for the entire state. So out-of-state students have many decisions of where to go, and part of UVM's appeal, according to the administration, or, or yeah, part of UVM's appeal is both the individual attention of, liberal, uh, of a liberal arts college um, as well as the resources of a comprehensive uh, research university. And with these proposed cuts um, and sort of the chronic underfunding in the College of Arts and Sciences, we're no longer getting uh, really either of these things. So um, it's difficult to get that individual attention when uh, the number of faculty are being greatly uh, cut. Um, so all UVM students in the state depends on UVM maintaining a comprehensive commitment to the liberal arts. When the administration proposed shutting down the ge geology department, they're actually hollowing out the, the university's um, commitment in, you know, in environmental sciences and the natural resources. All of these fields are all greatly related and it's important to leave the university whole and allow this to continue. Um, so the administration claims that they're listening to teachers and students, but it's quite clear that this isn't the case. Um, for To give one example of this, the geology faculty were uh, notified by email one day before meeting to propose um, to discuss the proposed cuts. So it's clear that these um, uh, cuts are rash and are being done without much oversight. So, uh, the, the administration's course has been rash and short-sighted in this way um, and done without any input from faculty, staff, and students because they don't want them to be called out for what they're doing. And that's betraying the mission of, uh, of UVM. Thank you, Dan, for closing out that debate for us. Um, I definitely have a lot of questions and things to think about after hearing uh, those opposing positions. So um, if everybody wants to uh, unmute yourself and give a hand to the debaters, especially acknowledging uh, Dr. Beth Mintz and soon to be Dr. Daniel Montano um, that are not debaters and so that they really you know, volunteered their time and stepped up to um, do this public service to put these arguments out there for public deliberation. So big congratulations um, and great job to everybody. Thanks for, um, thanks for this debate. We'll now have about 20 to 30 minutes for uh, questions and answers, questions coming from the audience and answers coming from the debaters. Uh, and we have already a couple of questions that have come in from the YouTube chat. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question that came in. Um, I think this question is probably best directed to Dr. Mintz. Um, and that question is, what is a thumbnail history of the corporatization of higher education? And how does uh, Garamella and his actions fit in with this trend of corporatization? Oh, that... You know, it's, uh, I, I'm embarrassed because I'm writing a book about this and to be able to come up with an answer to that question, um, one, one thread, let me, let me take one thread. 
so that um, so one thread about the corporatization is the competitive nature of the current university. We compete for everything. We compete with each other for faculty. But most interesting, I think, is we compete for students. And we compete for students by marketing our goods. The University of Vermont spent uh, a couple of years ago, spent, I think, $1 million on consultants to come up with a new logo. So to rebrand. So one, one part of the larger trend of corporatization is the university is marketer. We market ourselves in all sorts of different ways to bring in tuition dollars to pay the bills. And if we could sit down over a long period, we could have a much more robust discussion of corporatization. Thank you for that thumbnail version. I'm sure there's a lot to say on that question. Um, I know, you know, generally and in, in about UVM specifically. Um, so please, uh, those of you who are um, watching, please feel free to type your question into the chat, um, whether you're here on Zoom or uh, listening on YouTube, if you're one of our viewers on YouTube and I'll ask it of the um, participants. Um, the second question that's coming in from one of the YouTube viewers as well uh, is, do we know of any examples from UVM's past or from other universities in which endowment funds have been spent on other things than what donors have specified? Um, It seems like maybe um, Dr. Welch might answer, might have um, some answers to. Yes, yeah, so, um, so I have some um, initial uh, uh, responses and uh, others may have um, additional um, points to add as well. Uh, but first of all, in any given year, university administrations can decide to increase how much they draw on endowment revenue. That is the investment income generated by the endowment. And UVM in the past did increase how much it drew on the endowment in order to fund the STEM, um, uh, the, the new STEM buildings, the Innovation and Discovery Hall. So they can choose in any given year to tap the endowment for 5% or 7%, uh, you know, and then in another year, um, uh, you know, tap it for less. Also, many of the gifts to the endowment are very general. They are general gifts to a particular college or they are a gift to support undergraduate education. Uh, and so the university needs to be much more uh, and the University Foundation needs to be much more transparent about the nature of the gifts to the endowment rather than just repeatedly saying, oh, it's restricted, oh, it's restricted. Um, we know that it's not all restricted. Thanks for weighing in on that, uh, Dr. Welch. Um, a question coming in uh, from the Zoom room chat uh, from Jean Shea. If UVM were indeed in dire financial straits, why has UVM been growing its number of highly paid administrators and consultants and increasing executive salaries and bonuses? Yes, and the follow-up to that is, how is that holding to fiduciary responsibility and sustainability? And I would just continue to add on to that question is that I think they're also going through, I think, you know, some of Owens and I's research, they're also going through with their construction on the gymnasium and, and all of that stuff. So um, it's, it's very interesting. As Dr. Bailey has, Bailey has put in the chat, um, the administration is not here to answer that question. So perhaps we'll leave that as a rhetorical question for this moment, but hopefully one that the administration will answer um, you know, directly in their in their communication about um, how they see the administration is administrative and executive pay as um, part of their strategic investment, perhaps. Um, 
Are there uh, folks and also feel free if you would like to ask your question directly. I don't have to read it out. If you want to um, raise your hand, I can also call on you. Um, but I see another question has come in uh, from Susie Comerford on the chat, uh, which is what is the role of the Huron group at UVM? Is there maybe somebody um, on the debate, uh, uh, somebody in the debates that can answer, can can speak to what is, what is the Huron group uh, and what is their specific role at UVM? So um, I don't I don't know the answer to that, but I just I just will say the Huron Group is a consulting firm, and as I understand it, the university has contracted with them year after year after year, and the total amount of money that uh, they spent on the Huron Group, I believe, is in the millions. If somebody has more precise information, that would be fabulous. But this is one of the many 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 consultants who the university feeds. And I guess this is another part of the question about the corporatization of the university. The university works to, with profit generating companies and the university's first and foremost goal is to make money. Thank you. Dr. Bailey, I did see that you had um, unmuted your camera. Is there something that you wanted to add here about the Huron Group? I think that the faculty would very much like to know about the Huron Group. Uh, you may remember a few years ago, we had a thing called PeopleSoft come in. And I think that the Huron Group was paid some sort of consulting fee on that. And they got in big trouble over that because uh, they, uh, as I understand it, they overcharged. Also, a lot of the faculty are deeply suspicious because the Huron Group was founded by people who come from uh, who have Enron background. Um, and they seem to be a giant echo chamber that goes and asks university presidents what's great for universities. And then the university presidents say what's great for universities. And then they cite that as evidence for what's great for universities. Thank you for weighing in on that. Um, we've got another question coming in on the chat, um, as well as a point from UVM United Against the Cut that more than over 50 million over the past decade, it seems like has gone to the Huron Group. Um, but a question coming in from Helen Scott, uh, the administration were surprised by the higher than expected new enrollments in the College of Arts and Sciences for this upcoming year, academic year. Um, and has that changed their plans for program and department cuts? It hasn't changed the plans that I know of for classics. Uh, those plans were un unaffected by that. Is anybody else wanting to weigh in on this question? Dr. Welch, are you? Yeah, so I just uh, two things, um, you know, one is that I understand, although I don't know the outcome, is that the administration has attempted to um, rehire the three longtime award winning senior lecturers um, who they callously terminated in December, just ahead of the holidays. Um, but at least one of those senior lecturers um, was already given a, um, a, a position at an Ivy League institution. So, you know, our very best um, faculty members are going to other, other places. Um, and then finally, I, I think that the administration's claims about you know, that they have a vision for the future, they couldn't even envision the fall. They could not um, envision record enrollments and um, record enrollments in the liberal arts for the fall. So why should we trust them with a vision for UVM in 2050? Thanks for your thoughts on that. I just want to acknowledge a couple of the comments in the chat um, on the question of endowments. Uh, Maeve's iPad has indicated that on the um, 
that they can, I, I think that they can indeed be more flexible than so often claimed since a gift to Jewish studies was redirected out of CAS into the business school, I believe. Um, on the question of um, the Huron group, um, there's a note here as well that PeopleSoft was adopted despite their bad reputation among other universities. Um, and another point on this most latest question about um, you know what's changed for the fall, uh, CAS is now scrambling to ask faculty to teach overloads and to hire adjunct faculty to teach courses in the fall. So again, please feel free to um, put your questions in the chat. Um, also on YouTube, we are bringing in the questions here as well. So um, feel free to put them there. Um, it looks like a question just came in from YouTube. Uh, how can the president and other administrators be held to account for their misdeeds, including prioritizing their own salaries and falsifying a deficit? Um, does anybody want to speak to what you think needs to be done to help, like what, how, how can they be held to account? What is your proposal for a response to um, this claim of misdeeds and falsifying a de deficit? Well, we have this petition going for good reason. We don't have confidence in this administration, and I think that they should be told that. Um, also, I think that, you know, they've been telling us about this deficit for years, and I think that every time they mention a deficit, we should say, oh, the fake deficit, or, oh, the purported deficit, oh, the inadequate surplus to keep you at the level you are accustomed to. Um, I, th I think there's a lot of correction that's needed. And in the end, facts do come out. Uh, reality does have a way of uh, asserting itself. So I would sign the petition. While we're waiting for questions to come in, I do have a question for the affirmative team. Um, and I think one of the main claims being made by the administration is that they're making strategic investments that look to the long term. So whether or not the deficit at, at the at the current point, whether or not the you know the budget deficit and the budget is right in a in a crisis in the current point. Um, there is undoubtedly competition between universities uh, and a declining population, especially here in New England. Um, so we are anticipating declining enrollments, even though that's not true for the fall or the administration is de anticipating declining enrollments. And given that, right, and given what we've seen that some colleges around the state of Vermont have recently closed over the past couple of years, why shouldn't the administration be making strategic investments in uh, what they see, what, what the administration sees as its most exceptional or most growing programs, right? Why shouldn't they be putting money into um, the colleges that have, uh, uh, that students are showing the most interest in, or even in, in the College of Arts and Sciences, why shouldn't they be putting money into the departments that have um, growing enrollments? Um, why shouldn't they make those strategic investments? Why, why, why spread the money so thin if we do see a potential crisis coming in down the, if the administration sees this potential population cliff crisis coming in down on the road? I can kind of try to answer that. I think it's um, a reductive view of education where you just kind of focus on what's gonna make you money or like what they think is gonna last, um, especially when other schools are closing down and limiting, oh, there's some people. Uh, limiting um, the access to education that a lot of, especially Vermont students have. Um, that it really just like cuts people out of education. And I think that they may have said something about like, well, a lot of Vermont students don't go forward to like higher education. I think that that is a problem maybe that schools in Vermont need to be grappling with. Maybe that's their responsibility. Why aren't students going to school? Um, and it's, it's maybe something that they need to like really think about. Um, but I think it's I think it's a reductive way to look at education by just looking at the numbers because you then don't look at education as what value all of these courses and programs can put into the school, but just like how much money they can make you. Um, and so even when there is a crisis, being able to just say, oh, we'll get rid of classics um, is reducing uh, like the value that all of these things can give all students at the university. 
and saying that students who want to study those things don't really like they're they're like want to study those things isn't as important because it's not like a large number of majors or a large number of graduates. Thank you so much for addressing that question, Clara. Um, I see Dr. Scott uh, has her hand raised to address uh, the previous question. So if you wanna go ahead, Dr. Scott, and then I see Allison P, um, your hand, or no, not Allison, sorry, Trina uh, Maggi, your hand is also up and so I'll um, call on you next. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think that the question of how can the administration and the president be held accountable for their mismanagement and their you know what they're doing to the university is is the act it's the most important question over the last year the campaign against the cuts have had we've had car protests we've had press conferences we've had a teach-in we've had a debate this is our second debate we've had panels, we've had letter writing, we've had petitions, and thousands of people have participated in this campaign. And the administration have just consistently said, we don't care. They have shown their willingness to weather the storm of bad publicity, um, and they don't seem too concerned about the fact that thousands of students, faculty, and community members and staff are deeply concerned with what's being done to the university. So I, I think the, the, the issue here is one of power. And we need more power in order to make a sizable impact. And what that would look like is a strike. <laughs> Um, a student mass walkout, those kinds of events. And in order to get there, we need to build our numbers um, and continue to educate. Um, and, but more than, more than anything else, it's about building our numbers of people who are actively organizing um, so that we are strong enough to do something like a strike, like a war count that will interrupt business as usual. I think that those are the, that's the, the future that we have to look at to stop the administration from continuing to destroy this university. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Um, to, Trina, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, thanks. Hi, everybody. And thank you so much for this really great debate. I have a question. Um, I'm seeking clarity on the information about deficits. I understand that the supposed or alleged deficit related to the College of Arts and Sciences is really the result of, um, of, a, of a budget decision to take revenue out of that college and send it elsewhere to support other units. But when the, universe, when the university administration talks about the deficit in general, is that the deficit they're talking about? Or are they talking about a university-wide deficit, some other sort of global shortfall that they're claiming? Um, or, or are they one and the same? Is the College of Arts and Sciences so alleged deficit the entirety of the deficit the administration is talking about? Thank you. It's a great question. Does somebody um, uh, want to address that question? In the chat, um, UVM United Against the Cuts has said that they keep the administration keeps talking about structural challenges beyond C CAS, but they don't define what that is. I'm wondering if Isabella and Owen, um, if maybe you found something in your research where they discuss specifically anything about um, the deficit, if it's specific to CAS or if there are other sorts of deficit, deficit issues that they've addressed in their public communication. I would say I am not great with numbers. So I, someone may have better information about this. I saw it addressed though in my research and I believe in my speech, I stated it both ways. You know, I've seen it as just like a UVM deficit and a structural deficit in CATS. So I would agree that it's confusing, but I 
certainly think they want to make it sound like a cast deficit. Um, to me, as a person reading the news articles, it's very misleading. I, I think also um, they have accused faculty of confusing budgets with finances, but they are the ones who do that because we are basing our research and our figures on the audited financial books of UVM, which Richard Kate signed off on, and they're audited by external sources, and they show UVM is in an extremely strong position compared to other institutions and just in general. Um, here and there, there may be a shortfall, uh, but um, Overall, UVM is not in a deficit whatsoever. We, we had a $24 million surplus last year overall. The way that they get to a deficit in CAS is by calling the budget document a deficit. Now, when I decide that I'm going to budget $2 for food for the year, um, and then I, lo and behold, overspend, I am in deficit on my food budget, right? No, wrong, actually. Uh, you can't confuse the budget with the uh, finances. Budgets are plans, they are priorities, they are ideas. The audited financial books and, and Moody's reports are uh, externally verified and they show no deficit. They show no deficit at UVM, they show no deficit in CAS. Uh, what the numbers for CAS show is that about $7 million per year goes straight from all that undergraduate tuition paid by College of Arts and Science students into other units, uh, including a large, large portion of it that goes straight to the Larner College of Medicine, which has no uh, undergraduate degrees and is massively supported by undergraduate tuition. I love the Larner College of Medicine. I want it to be healthy, but they can't keep cannibalizing CAS to try and make that so. So we do have a little bit more time if there are any remaining questions um, of anybody out there in the audience um, on YouTube, you can feel free to uh, put your question in the chat there and it will be shared here or if you're here in the zoom room feel free to raise your hand or put your question into the chat. Um, so I'll just give you know about one more minute to see if there's anybody else that wants to ask a question. Otherwise, um, we are going to move to our closing speech. So I'll just give one more minute, just in case you're typing it in. All right, so Allison P has come through with a question. Uh, how is this possible that um, COM, which I think you mean the College of Medicine, as I'm guessing, needs so much from uh, the College of Arts and Sciences when they have such a huge research grant income. So why is it that CAS is supporting financially the College of Medicine? This is a great question and one that I've, um, that I've also asked. Doesn't the College of Medicine have tons of money? Um, it looks like uh, Dan is ready to answer this question. I wouldn't say that I'm ready. So I don't know why it's happening, but I could say in part like how it's happening. So even though the College of Medicine doesn't offer um, any undergraduate degrees, um, there are some departments like the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics that are placed both in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, CALS, um, also with some kind of arrangement with the medical school um, that they discuss on their website. And in that, and another way that this is happening is through courses taught uh, particularly like wellness environment courses, which are required for uh, students that live uh, in those dorms. So uh, the, they are essentially, you know, in, in my opinion, kind of gaming the incentive based budgeting system to actually funnel that money. Um, as for the reason why, I, I'm not sure. Thanks for that. Um, Dr. Welch, did you wanna add something there? 
Uh, yes. So if you go to uh, uvmunited.org, the uh, website for UVM United Against the Cuts, you'll find there uh, two, and it's also on our YouTube channel as well, uh, but two infographic videos that the uh, cartoonist Glynis Fox has put together for us. And one of those cartoons um, also features the um, number of enormously expensive deans in the Larner College of, of Medicine. My understanding is that there are actually a number of, of critically important um, medical and, and biomedical training programs that Larner offers that are also being targeted for being cut because they have small enrollments. They have small enrollments, not because they're not popular, but because they are very um, specific. And this is the thing, like, like, like there, there are particular um, areas of education and of, of professional preparation that people need that, um, that, that don't need large numbers of, of students, um, but do, um, do need to be supported. So, so Larner also has programs that are, that are being threatened while they have their, the Dean of the College of Medicine actually draws an annual income that is higher than um, Suresh Garamella's income. So this is one thing to think about is that the College of Arts and Sciences is being drained to support some very expensive deans in the College of, of Medicine, um, but also across the university. If I could just real quickly piggyback off that, I, as was stated in the introduction, I'm also a music education major and a history major and music education is one of those that's very specific. There's, you know, I believe I have three uh, peers who will graduate in my year, you know what I mean? It's not a large major. Um, but there's not a ton of jobs for music educators, but the well, another one of the issues is, A, we're having trouble meeting our classes because now, you know, they want us to have at least 10 people to have all of our classes, but we usually have very small class sizes of about six people. So we're, we're having issues with that. I'm having issues taking all of my classes. The other thing is um, this, this major is in the College of Education, which is great, but um, all of the support, all of the classes, all of the faculty, all the teachers are in the College of Arts and Sciences, but all of my, you know, the money goes to education, but the College of Arts and Sciences is putting on all of these things. I don't say this to say anything. It's just, it's really interesting to me, and this has come up in a lot of my discussions with faculty members in the music department, how how much bureaucracy is involved and how impractical a lot of the scenes and how really difficult it is for the faculty and myself as the student, um, music education has not been cut as of yet, but again, as I said, it's very small, and we heard in, um, December, our, our advisor emailed all of us saying, it, you know, there was an article that said we were close to being cut. So don't be alarmed. But it's very alarming when you hear that your major is in danger of being cut or the resources are not being provided there. So um, just thought I'd add that. And I'll just say what a disservice it would be to lose a, an excellent student like Isabel Bernie because we didn't offer a major like music education to, to bring somebody like her here. Um, it looks like we have time for one last question, and I see a hand up by Allison P. So um, why don't you go ahead? Thanks very much, Helen. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the role of the Board of Trustees. I think they do not understand what the flagship University of Vermont should be, getting back to Clara's remarks. I know over the years that they have purposefully disassociated themselves with the educational mission, considering that they're really the overseers of fiduciary responsibility, et cetera. But by removing themselves from this important core mission, they have enabled and worsened the situation that we're in right now. So in, in the last, as I understand it, hiring uh, Garamella was done very quickly without any competition and without any community feedback. So I'm thinking that that is the crux of the problem that we have to somehow in, in, get the trustees to understand that their role is not what they think it is and that what they are doing has to be more than treating this as a business in, a, in some kind of a corporate boardroom.
I couldn't agree more. I feel like one important step would be constituent elected members of the Board of Trustees, just as the House bill proposes for faculty and staff, but I feel like it should be extended to include democratic elections for undergraduate and graduate students as well, um, as well as taking into account the, um, I guess, interests of graduate employees um, as like an addition on the staff members. Really, all of these groups should be acting in solidarity to you know, meet these common goals that will benefit everyone at the university, since it's clear that the way you know, this board is constructed now, that there is no care for the actual uh, elements that make the university up. I see that in the chat, Justin has said that um, he could also speak to this question. Yeah, I'd like to add, um, but totally agree with what Dan just said. Uh, democratizing the Board of Trustees is really important, I think probably for two main reasons. One, it's very clear that the Board of Trustees really only hears from the administration. They're very insulated and uh, uh, the ability to publicly have any interaction with the Board of Trustees is incredibly limited. So uh, as part of some of the work that the United Academics is doing, not only as Dan mentioned, we're really trying to work to push this house bill, which now looks like something we'll be looking for next year uh, to try and democratize the board and change the makeup of the board a little bit. But at a minimum right now, we're very close to a board meeting that uh, really, we don't think that the university and the board of trustees meetings are necessarily following the, the really strict interpretation of the laws or the or the really intent of the laws around public access and so we're trying to increase access and and push the legislative trustees and really just try and get the board of trustees to open up more access to their meetings so we can even hear what it is that they're saying so uh, as of now it seems as though you're right allison the problem is the board of trustees they're incredibly insular uh, but they have kind of with the administration really made it so as it's hard to to make that anything other than that insular nature uh, so we should fight to change that yeah thanks thanks for those comments um and i see there's a comment in the chat as well that there's a bill in the vermont legislature to add faculty and staff to the board of trustees so folks should know about that um, I recognize that there's a lot of questions that were directed to the administration um, and because they're not here to answer these questions, there's sort of a limited response on what, what would their, their response be. Um, and, you know, the, the students on the debate team made a good faith effort to present their arguments, um, but didn't want to just sort of guess at what the administration's responses would be maybe to your, you know, potentially really tough questions. So I do hope that the administration, if, um, you know, you're out there watching um, that you do agree to um, come to some of these public debates um, in which uh, folks are asking you to debate um, and as a sort of good faith call, right? That we really, um, we want to engage in, um, you know, we want, and the Lawrence Debate Union would like to host and facilitate a good faith engagement um, on these questions uh, for the benefit of the public. Um, and so um, despite that, despite the sort of limited nature of which we could sort of address some of these questions here today, I hope that those of you who are out there um, listening um, and watching the debate tonight have a better sense of sort of what's at stake in this debate, um, what the main arguments are around student enrollment, uh, sort of fiscal responsibility and the sort of fiscal situation of UVM. Um, as well as questions about, you know, strategic investments um, uh, from both an ethical, political, um, as well as, I guess, thirdly, from a financial matter as well. Um, so with that, I am going to close out my own role as moderator of this public debate and turn it over to uh, Professor Jacques Bailey, who again is a professor in uh, the Department of Classics, uh, who is going to um, offer up some closing remarks uh, for the public debate tonight. Um, but as I, as I move to the background, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, and I hope that this debate has offered up some food for thought for you um, in thinking about these important issues in our community. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Bailey. Thank, thank you, Helen. I'll try and keep my remarks short. Um, there is an awful lot to talk about. Uh, we have a great many magnificent programs at UVM, uh, including ones in the College of Arts and Sciences, including professional ones, including a, a great medical school. 
And keeping our professional schools nimble and responsive and growing is a great idea. <laughs> but it can't be at the expense of the liberal arts education, which is the prime feature of the vision statement of the University of Vermont and has long been that. Um, and it also can't be at the expense of the most profitable part of UVM, which is, I'm afraid, the College of Arts and Sciences. We make a heck of a lot of money. It can't be my milking undergraduate tuition. Uh, and I, I want it to be clear that these figures that um, you'll hear from faculty about the finances at UVM, all of the ones you'll hear from me, all the ones you'll hear from a lot of us are from audited financial statements. And they're also from a report by Moody's, which recently renewed UVM's tremendously good bond rating. Uh, you'll hear from the administration about, oh, it's restricted funds. We can't just redirect these funds. They're restricted. Somebody gave this money for a, a lectureship in this. <laughs> what I think is missing here is that um, undergraduate tuition is the gold standard of absolutely unrestricted funds. When an undergraduate pays money to the UVM, they can use it for whatever they want. Uh, this, th and so the College of Arts and Sciences, which makes far and away the most money from uh, undergraduate tuition is the one that is being milked probably for that reason. So, so let's move on. We hear this, uh, that the change has to happen. I think a very little bit of reflection will tell you that yes, change does have to happen, but it has to be good change. It needs to be truly farsighted, not just chasing whatever the current jobs fad is only to have to turn on a dime and shut down another program and start up a new one. But the liberal arts doesn't, is, is not nimble. The liberal arts is long and lasting and has roots and it will continue to do so. We hear that we need job readiness. Liberal arts is job readiness. It is the most transferable, the most valuable skill you can have is your ability to think and reflect on what you are as a human and on the human condition and how to put things into words that are persuasive. Uh, I, I am frankly flabbergasted by the idea that these cuts will strengthen liberal arts and UVM. This is like the Monty Python skit that says, I love animals and that's why I kill them. Uh, you can't strengthen the liberal arts by cutting 27 depart, uh, programs, mostly in the humanities. You can't strengthen the liberal arts by cutting three whole programs, three whole departments in the liberal arts. Now, all of these cuts are going to raise enrollments uh, in, per class. They're going to raise the student-faculty ratio. We'll have larger classes. They will reduce the choice for undergraduates. Now, if I'm a, somebody looking at UVM, thinking whether I want to go there, I want more choice. I want smaller classes. We talk about the long-range goal. Well, the long-range goal is to stay a strong and vibrant land-grant institution for Vermont. And to do that, we have to keep attracting a lot of students. We can't afford to make ourselves less attractive in this way. I speak about the College of Arts and Sciences because that's what I know, but there's cuts all across the board here. The College of Arts and Sciences is cutting 27 programs apparently. Now, what are they saving? $600,000. They're cutting 20% of their programs to save $600,000. That's about $25,000 per program. $25,000 per program. Now that is a fantastic bargain. Now, now, and if they're going to target these low major programs, never mind the fact that all of these programs teach hundreds of students, uh, at least the departments do, the religious studies and geology and classics, we teach hundreds of students, if not thousands. Uh, so who's next? Art history, physics. We just heard musical ed, has, musical education has few uh, majors. But these are all fundamental things that a land grant institution should be offering its citizens. So let me just leave you with this thought. This is about institutional priorities. It's a struggle for UVM's soul. This administration's priorities are strategic, but they are strategically aimed at things like Department of Defense research grants and big business interests. And whatever is currently in demand on the job market 
where UVM can make more money. They are not strategically aimed at meeting the true demographic challenge that is facing all of New England and all of its colleges, which is uh, fewer uh, people applying to college from New England. That will be solved by making the overall undergraduate education at UVM of strong and lasting value. Their strategy is simply not in line with the long standing vision statement of UVM, which says that we are to be a comp to, to exhibit a comprehensive commitment to and education in the liberal arts. Why do we want to offer those? Because they're the most flexible skills our students can possibly have to make them good employees but also equally, if not more importantly, to make them good citizens and engaged humans. I certainly hope that this debate has clarified some of these issues and made you think about them. Thank you. All right, thank you to all of the participants for tonight. Um, and that concludes our events for this evening. I wanna thank everybody for coming. Um, those of you who joined us here on Zoom and on uh, YouTube and for all of the future viewers who weren't able to uh, join us in real time who will be viewing this uh, asynchronously. Um, thank you so much for um, uh, tuning in and listening. And um, we hope that you, um, you know, we'll follow up on these questions and feel like you're in a better position to make decisions about how you feel about this particular topic and actions that you want to take in response. Um, so again, thank you. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the Lawrence Debate Union, uh, um, please feel free to visit our website, which you can find um, here in the chat. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at our next public debate on the topic yet to be determined. Uh, and if there's one that you'd like to see debated, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, again, thank you to all of the participants for all of your hard work, um, putting in um, much many hours to this debate uh, and um, for every, to everybody for coming. And I'll see you soon. <laughs>